Hello, and welcome to our fifth lecture as we continue uh, discussing uh, neurons and neurotransmission in this uh, series on cognitive neuroscience. In this lecture, I'll be talking about chemical transmission, in particular, uh, how that process works, and uh, discussing neurotransmitters themselves. In the second part of this lecture, um, I will be talking about the neurotransmitter systems and how they function, and uh, briefly talk about electrical transmission. But let's start with chemical transmission. We're going to review a little bit about the action potential and then talk about what happens when the action potential reaches the end of an axon, triggering the release of neurotransmitters. We'll talk about neurotransmitter receptors, autoreceptors, reuptake transporter proteins, and enzyme degradation. These are all important parts of this chemical transmission process that both trigger uh, neural signaling and also um, turn off neural signaling. Let's start by talking about the action potential. So, as we spoke in our last lecture, the action potential is a, uh, an electrical signal that is generated or propagated along the membrane of a neuron by the opening and closing of ion channels. When that reaches the axon terminal buttons, voltage gated calcium channels open. And those calcium channels uh, are important because as calcium enters the cells, that then causes uh, vesicles to fuse with the cellular membrane and release neurotransmitters into the synapse. Remember, neurotransmitters are packaged in sort of small packets called vesicles. And then uh, the entering of calcium into the cell triggers them to fuse with the cellular membrane and then uh, release the neurotransmitter into the synapse in a process known as exocytosis. And so this is how neurotransmitters enter the synapse, which you can see visualized over here on the right. So those neurotransmitters that are released by the terminal button of a presynaptic neuron and then diffuse across the synapse to the postsynaptic neuron. So they're released through that process of exocytosis when the action potential reaches the terminal button, causing those voltage gated calcium channels to open and the vesicles to release their neurotransmitter into the synapse. Those neurotransmitters then travel across the synapse and bind to specific receptors and receptor subtypes. And that's one of the things we'll talk about um, in the next lecture is the various receptor subtypes. So for example, there are numerous serotonin receptor subtypes, numerous dopamine receptor subtypes, and each of these, while they will respond to dopamine, they respond in different ways, and the serotonin, well, they'll also respond to serotonin, but each receptor type responds in a very specific way. So those neurotransmitters fit receptor sites pretty much like a key fits a lock. And as I said, there are many receptor subtypes for each class of neurotransmitters, and they often have very different effects uh, from uh, the same neurotransmitter. So while there's only one molecule uh, shape of the neurotransmitter, the receptors themselves often have very different effects. And so as we start talking about how drugs might influence cognition, we'll talk about how uh, different drugs affect different receptor subtypes. So for example, some drugs might affect the dopamine two or three or four receptor subtypes. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, further in the semester. So generally speaking, uh, we talk about there being two classes of receptors. Ionotropic receptors uh, react immediately by opening channels uh, and either hyperpolarizing or depolarizing the cell depending on which channels they open. And metabotropic, or what are often called G-coupled protein receptors, um, cause longer-term changes in uh, a neuron via secondary messenger proteins that are released inside the cell. And so these metabotropic or G-coupled protein receptors will oftentimes change the metabolic properties of the cell, uh, cause it to change um, uh, its overall longer-term properties. And so these uh, function very differently from the ionotropic receptors, which uh, react immediately. So the next thing I want to talk about are autoreceptors, and these are an important part of understanding how uh, neurons sort of turn off the neurotransmitter process. So autoreceptors uh, are on the presynaptic neuron. So in addition to binding with postsynaptic receptors, neurotransmitters will bind to presynaptic autoreceptors. And the function of these autoreceptors is to signal the presynaptic neuron to stop releasing neurotransmitters. And basically, it shuts off that process of exocytosis. And this is how we sort of turn neural signals on and off. 
And so the first process in sort of shutting down that neural signal is to stop the release of neurotransmitters into the synapse, and this occurs via autoreceptors. Now, these can be targets for drugs. So for example, I believe cocaine uh, has an effect on the autoreceptor, so more dopamine is released. Um, little, little, little. Cocaine is also a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, so it dramatically increases the amount of uh, dopamine available in the synapse. The other process that's occurring at this time are, uh, is the reuptake of neurotransmitters into the presynaptic neuron, and this is accomplished by reuptake transporter proteins. So this is one of the primary processes by which chemical transmission is stopped by taking those neurotransmitters back in via these transporter proteins. This is an active process. Uh, important to understand those neurotransmitters can then be repackaged in vesicles and then re-released, so it's basically recycling, reusing. Um, so this allows reuse of those neurotransmitters by the presynaptic neuron. And importantly, many psychoactive drugs are actually reuptake inhibitors. As I just mentioned, cocaine is a reuptake inhibitor. Um, more of you are probably familiar with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. These are antidepressant drugs like Prozac, Zoloft, um, etc. And these drugs block that reuptake uh, uh, transporter protein, and they uh, are selected because they don't block all serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They only block some um, receptor type reuptake inhibitor, yeah, reuptake proteins. Sorry. Uh, and then we also um, often talk about um, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or NRIs. And oftentimes, uh, antidepressant drugs include both an SSRI and an NRI component. And we'll talk about that more later. Uh, finally, in the synapse itself are enzymes, which break down uh, neurotransmitters into constituent components, which can then be um, taken away. So oftentimes neurotransmitters are too large uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier back into the blood to be taken off, uh, to be disposed of. So they're broken down into constituent proteins. Uh, these enzymes include uh, acetylcholine esterase. We'll talk about acetylcholine here in a moment. But acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse. Interestingly, there are uh, different substances which can um, inhibit acetylcholine esterase. These are called ACE inhibitors, or reversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Uh, these reversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors include cognitive enhancing drugs like um, Aricept, which is a drug given to Alzheimer's patients, to marginal effect. Uh, there are also irreversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, and these tend to be very toxic. These are nerve gases and pesticides, which really for our purposes are the same thing. And these function by um, shutting down the breakdown of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is involved in our um, muscle, muscular systems as well as our sympathetic nervous system. And in fact, our body's internal environment is regulated almost primarily by <clears throat> acetylcholine. And so this buildup of acetylcholine in the synapse causes muscle twitching and also then causes cardiac arrest uh, because of uh, the overproduction of acetylcholine uh, in the synapse uh, causes the cardiac muscles to um, overfire. That is, they keep firing and so you end up uh, with a heart race uh, that races and then eventually will stop. Monoamine oxidase is a an enzyme which breaks down monoamines, such as um, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, um, particularly dopamine and norepinephrine. Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors um, block monoamine oxidase from breaking down these particular neurotransmitters, and so increase their availability in the synapse. So that's uh, a little bit about how neurotransmission is stopped. I want to talk a little bit about the classica classification of neurotransmitters. Uh, first, we can classify them by chemical structure. So we have the amino acids, which include gamma amino butyric acid, or GABA. GABA is an incredibly important neurotransmitter. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and one we'll be spending a lot of time talking about throughout the semester. Glutamate, also another uh, excitatory. This is an excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, glycine and aspirate are all uh, amino acids. The amines include catecholamines, which include dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, and the indolamines, which are um, serotonin and melatonin. These have similar uh, chemical structures and, importantly, are uh, synthesized from a couple of classes of proteins, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. <clears throat> 
You can also classify neurotransmitters by their function. It really depends on the receptor type, but we generally classify them into excitatory and inhibitory as the sort of the first sort of general cleaving of, of the functions of these particular neurotransmitters. So the excitatory neurotransmitters we often talk about are acetylcholine, acetylcholine glutamate, and histamine. The reason why allergy drugs like Benadryl or diphenhydramine um, make you so sleepy is because they are antihistamines. And so by blocking that excitatory neurotransmitter, you end up with um, being a little bit sedated. Uh, similarly, uh, GABA or gamma butyric acid is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and a number of sedative drugs um, such as benzodiazepines, Valium, Xanax, Ativan, um, are, uh, have exert their influence by increasing the efficacy of GABA. So we're going to be talking about these uh, at various com points throughout the semester. So finally, I wanted to briefly just uh, overview uh, the synthesis of neurotransmitters. Um, acetylcholine is uh, metabolized into choline or comes from the diet, which is then uh, converted into acetylcholine. The um, catecholamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, start uh, from phenylalanine, which are then metabolized into tyrosine. Tyrosine is also available from the diet as well, which is then converted into dopa, and then converted into dopamine, norepinephrine, and then epinephrine. Uh, tryptophan is, of course, uh, famously uh, contained in turkey, uh, which can then be converted into the 5-HT or 5-hydroxytryptophan, which you can actually take as a supplement. I don't recommend it. Um, and then that gets metabolized into serotonin. Um, this tryptophan is, of course, uh, part of uh, legend because it also is, is a precursor for uh, melatonin. You don't get sleepy after eating turkey. You get sleepy after eating um, platefuls of carbohydrates on Thanksgiving. So it's not the tryptophan. It's the carbohydrates. All right. So that's an introduction to neurotransmitters. In the next lecture, we're going to get into a discussion of neurotransmitter systems and how these function.